now, our second book adaptation, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, George Orwell's offbeat tale of love, poetry, poverty and the dilemma of selling out. Richard E. Grant plays the impecunious poet and Helena Bonham Carter is his long-suffering girlfriend. Here's Richie to tell you all about it. So what's it all about then? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's about an unemployed writer who fancies himself as a poet and literary figure in the 1930s um, and it's very autobiographically based on um, George Orwell's struggling years pre-1984, pre-Animal Farm success um, and he gives up a well-paid job in advertising and then you know, thinks that as a middle-class person he can downmarket himself by going and living in Lambeth and <coughs> absorbing you know, life on the edge as it were. Are those the only clothes you have? Why don't you wear your suit? I was sick on it. It's at the dry clean as being de-vomited. Yeah, I think it's a classic case that, that still persists now of somebody who's middle class stabbing themselves for being middle class, um, trying to be working class but you know, never succeeding. Could you play working class? <laughs> no, because I've never, I've never been cast as somebody working class. I've never tried to pass myself off as working class, but I think people would laugh outright at my face. And I've yet to meet a working class person that... Um, Votes conservative? That doesn't drink, um, owns a Cortina, <laughs> smells. Entertains the middle class ideal that somehow living in bohemian poverty is something fabulous and to aspire to. It's not? People want to go up, they don't want to go, go down. I will not make love where dogs are peed. You're so middle class. That's not middle class, that's hygienic. Two of your films, LA Story and The Player, were direct swipes at Hollywood. Was it so bad out there? Was it so bad? I think that, uh, you know, Hollywood is self, it's like a hydra. You cut off one head or you satirize one thing and up pops something else that's even more ridiculous than before. And in a cost mess. <laughs> there is so much money concentrated in Los Angeles and such extremes of um, behavior as a result that it's inevitable that it's, it's going to attract interest. And the kind of people attracted to go and live there and people doing anything to be famous. Um, means that, you know, the bungee jumping eager antics of people are unlike anywhere else. Actually, I've got a script I've been working on. Alex. What? So you wouldn't live there? No, I've, no, I've never lived there. I mean, I've, I've worked there, but um, I'm very glad that there's now a buoyant industry that I can, I can work here without having to go over there. Were you flattered that your film opened the London Film Festival this year? Well, I thought it was an an indication that uh, there was faith in an English film that wasn't directed by Mike Lee. With, I mean, no disrespect by that, but in the local Odeon where I live, um, in all seven screens, uh, I think for the last month or so, every movie has been a British movie. That's, I've, uh, it's just never happened in 15 years I've lived here. So, um, I mean, whether the good, bad, whatever, the fact that, you know, the full Monty, Oscar Wilde, Shooting Fish, all of these movies are playing, which two years ago just didn't, you know, if you'd said there were going to be three movies in the main sections of the movie houses rather than in screen 17 of the local Odeon that seats five people and, you know, stale fart air, um, <laughs> it's been a complete turnaround. So long may it last. It's eight shillings a week. But that includes anybody you want to fetch home, if you catch my meaning. That's very reasonable. And if nobody wants to come home with you, don't be afraid to ask. <laughs> Keep the Aspidistra flying? What a title. It's terrible. What? <laughs> it's being honest. Well, it's a great book. Brown, was it a great film? The more I've thought about this one, the more I've liked it, basically. Um, the acting in it is superb. You can't fault any of them, not even Helena Bonham Carter, who usually annoys the, the hell out of me. I thought it was a, a great film all round. Had loads of really, really funny moments in it. Richard E. Grant, uh, total return to form. Wonderful to see him playing a drunk again after With No and I. I felt the script was fantastic. Uh, Richard E. Grant showing fantastic dynamism. He goes through this procedure of playing these roles and they don't mm. fulfill him. And then, for me, the ending, it all comes full circle and things work out really well, and I felt the ending was very satisfying. The conclusion at first, I found it quite disappointing. I thought it was about his compromises. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought it's a good conclusion, it's realistic, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I really enjoyed it. I came out of the cinema smiling. Mm -hmm. um, I laughed out loud a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, 
I wasn't quite sure what message they were trying to convey. If it lacks a message or if you can't figure one. out the message, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's not a problem to me. I thought it looked beautiful. I thought it, there were brilliant performances, especially from the minor characters. But overall, there was something missing. There was a magic. There was, a, there was something not there. I would recommend it to anyone, but I'm completely sold on it. I'm a great Richard E. Grant fan. It's the kind of film my mum would love with all mm. the 30s costume and the, the romance between the two leads. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the kind of film my parents would adore. Let's have some scores then for Keep the Aspidistra Flying. Richard E. Grant was made for this movie. Six. Thought-provoking and intelligent fun. Eight. A beautiful, well-crafted, but empty film. Five. Witty and delightful. See it. Eight. Giving Keep the Aspidistra Flying 27 points.